Hello, and welcome to Big Think Live. I'm Jason Gotts, and I'm here today with Matt Hudson. He's the author of The Seven Laws of Magical Thinking, How Irrational Beliefs Keep Us Happy, Healthy, and Sane. Matt, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. You say in your book that we all believe in magic, luck, mind over matter, destiny, jinxes, life after death, evil, and heavenly helpers, even when we say we don't. How is that the case? Well, magical thinking relies on very basic cognitive tendencies that we all share. So for instance, we tend to see patterns in the world and read meaning into those patterns. This is basically how we learn. And sometimes we read meaning into patterns where there is no inherent meaning. So we see faces in the clouds or we hear messages and records played backwards. And one type of pattern that we read meaning into is seeming correlations between our things inside our heads and things outside in the world. So if a thought matches up with some event, then you see a correlation and perhaps causation. So let's say you think about something and then it happens. You might think that your thought caused that event, or maybe your thought was a premonition of the event. Or maybe something happens in your life that has some particular meaning for you. You might think that the event happened because it had meaning for you, because it was meant to improve your life somehow or perhaps it was meant as a sign directed for you. But, you know, if we, you know, rationally analyze these patterns, like if we're very careful and we sort of, you know, think about our thinking and say, okay, I, you know, I thought that for a moment I felt that there was a correlation between those things, but does that really make sense? I mean, is it not possible to dispel all of those or most of those kinds of magical beliefs? Sure, it's possible to dispel them. A lot of our intuitions are wrong. We, we have a lot of cognitive biases and heuristics. We, we make shortcuts. Uh, and of course, it's possible to use rationality and to use things that you know about the world to question your intuitions and to second guess them. Um, and this is sometimes called skepticism. It's sometimes called critical thinking uh, or science. So at one point in your book, you give a definition of magical thinking like this. Um, we instinctively treat the mind as though it had physical properties, and we treat the physical world as though it had mental properties. What is the evolutionary logic for this mingling of mind and matter? Well, one cause of us seeing the natural world as, being, uh, as having elements of mind is our tendency to anthropomorphize things. So we see... Uh, things that aren't alive as alive, or we see natural events as being caused by living, thinking beings. And it's because we, we're biased to see life in the world because you don't want to miss animals or people who could help you or who could, who could harm you. Uh, so for instance, one anthropologist says that it's better to mistake a boulder for a bear than to mistake a bear for a boulder. You definitely don't want to miss that. And so you, you, know, you might see your laptop as uh, if it crashes, you'll yell at it as if, it's, as if it meant to do that. Or if there's a, a wrestle in the bushes, you might see it as you know, perhaps an animal caused it. Or let's say some event happened in your life that has some meaning for you, and you can't blame it on a person or on an, on an animal. You'll seek out some sort of other intentional mind out there, whether it's a spirit or, or God or just, just the universe in general. You write that the same magical thinking that leads to sentimentality, altruism, and self-efficacy can also lead to vilification, fatalism, and irrational exuberance, or even depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, and psychosis. In other words, magical thinking can have both positive and extremely negative consequences. So can you explain your attitude toward magical thinking and what it is that you hope to accomplish by studying it? Well, my, my primary goal in studying magical thinking is to understand the cause of it, to understand why it's so common. Uh, beyond that, I'm also interested in the possible benefits and drawbacks. So you might think that illusions are necessarily bad, and it's good to have a completely realistic picture of the world. Uh, but to me, the more surprising aspect was that it's occasionally good to have these illusions, and magical thinking can be, can be beneficial even if it's uh, not an accurate picture of reality. You focus on what you call shadow beliefs, those beliefs that we don't really even think of as magical, 
and some are even quite banal, but these are beliefs that guide us through the world every day. I'd like to ask you about some of the various categories of these beliefs. Let's start with objects. Can you tell us about the Beanie Baby that you slept with for eight years and what it meant to you to lose him? Sure. So I had this Beanie Baby uh, that I bought when I, I spent the summer in Alaska when I was 18, uh, right after high school. And when I got to Anchorage, I, I bought this little stuffed red dragon. And uh, I kept him with me while I was up in Alaska during this sort of, this was, it was an important summer for me. I did a lot of growing that summer. And I kept him with me for the next eight years of my life, uh, sleeping with him every night. Uh, and then one night, he, he ran away from me. Uh, basically, I, I lost him. Um, and I could have, of course, tried to find another similar Beanie Baby. Um, but it just wouldn't be the same. There was something special about that particular Beanie Baby, who, who I named Blip. Uh, and that's because we, we treat objects as if they're special because of their, their histories, their particular histories. So you might think that there's some sort of non-physical essence that's part of an object. So this is why people value celebrity memorabilia or family heirlooms, um, or why you'd feel differently about wearing a, a clean sweater that had been worn by a serial killer versus one that had been worn by a significant other. It's as if somehow the, the object's particular history or perhaps the people who have touched the object is somehow embedded in it as some sort of non-physical non essence. How do you sort out which, or how do you even begin to go about sorting out which superstitions, you know, are valuable and which are not, like which we ought to keep and which we ought to try to work to get rid of? Yeah, so it's, it's very difficult trying to suss out which superstitions are good for you and to what degree and in which situations you should use magical thinking. Uh, I would say that in a, a very general rule of thumb would be to look at whether, not focus on whether a particular illusion is, or whether a particular intuition or belief is an accurate picture of reality, but to wonder whether it's a useful picture of reality. So is it, is it changing your behavior in, in ways that you think is helpful for you or for the people around you? Okay. Um, you write about non-human agents, such as pets, who we talk to and substitute for real people and even over-attribute certain mental capacities to. Um, why do we do this, and how do we draw the line between what's normal and what is um, crazy cat lady territory? Um, so yeah, it's, it's this bias to anthropomorphize things that leads us to treat inanimate objects as alive, or to read things that are alive, to treat things that are alive, like pets, as if they are more conscious or more intelligent than they actually are. Uh, and so you can become a crazy cat lady if you abandon actual people in your environment and just focus on, on your pets or your stuffed animals or your live doll or whatever you have. Um, but it can also be helpful. There's research showing that pets uh, increase people's mental and physical health and well-being. And I actually visited a VA hospital in DC where they made use of this robotic baby seal. It's a $6,000 robot that's white and fluffy and and the people at the hospital they hold it in their laps and it it purrs and it responds to your touch and uh, these guys they they knew that it's just a robot they know that it's not alive but still their their magical thinking and their anthropomorphizing uh, leads them to treat it as if it's an, a real companion and they speak to it and it and it helps them and it, and it gives them comfort Speaking of robots, um, we're increasingly dealing with uh, voice-activated software like Siri and you know computers that are talking back to us and so on. Mm -hmm. So how how does um, you know how does this kind of magical thinking enter into those interactions, and um, how can we make our relationship with these new technologies most beneficial? Or do you have any thoughts on on that? Well, we're a very social species. We've evolved to interact with other people. We haven't evolved to interact with computers. And so rather than trying to reprogram our brains to uh, try to think in code or to try to you know, understand silicon, uh, it makes more sense to try to program computers to behave more like people so that we can interact more fluidly with them. Um, we want to broach the topic of religion. Um, you, note, you note in your book that only 16% of Americans believe 
humans evolved with no magical or divine intervention. And quote Richard Dawkins, who wrote, it's almost as if the human brain were specifically designed to misunderstand Darwin and to find it hard to believe. Why do humans default to the belief that we are part of a grand design? Well, in part, this relies on our, our general bias to read intentionality into things, to see things as happening uh, for a reason, to believe that objects in our, around us have been designed for some purpose. This is called teleological reasoning. Uh, we're especially likely to do this when we see uh, something that has a lot of order to it. So for instance, humans, you know, you, if a bunch of particles just got together and like fell together into a pile and it, it turned into a human, you'd be very surprised. So, you know, it seems like there should be some sort of um, organism or, or intentionality that would arrange these things. And so that's just our, um, our bias or uh, it, it's a very good rule of thumb. Uh, generally, because of entropy, order dissipates. So whenever order comes together, it's often because uh, someone or something put it that way. Um, while you say that everyone uses magical thinking, what do you see as the key difference between skeptics and non-skeptics? Well, skeptics and non-skeptics are, are very similar in a lot of ways. We all share the same intuitions. We all have the same instinct for magical thinking. And people who are less superstitious are actually uh, not necessarily more intelligent or more educated than other people. It's really that they have a tendency to question their intuitions. Uh, so it's partly motivation, partly habits. Uh, if you're more motivated to try to get down to the, the basics and try to figure out, okay, what's real and what isn't. Um, or if you've done this a lot and it becomes second nature just through a habit of, of questioning your beliefs and questioning your perceptions and questioning illusions, then you're more likely to be, become uh, a skeptic. I mean, yet while we might, might not be able to say that it's a question of intelligence, you know, the difference, um, I, I guess, would, would you say that intentionality and awareness with respect to our own superstitions and magical thinking is important and useful in terms of deciding and trying to sort of figure out and guide our own consciousness in the ways that are beneficial to us. Sure, yeah. Uh, so I, I mentioned before that uh, often it's more important to have a useful perception of reality than an accurate perception of reality. But of course, in, in many cases, an accurate perception of reality is a useful perception of reality. And so it's important to try to figure out what, you know, what, react, what reality actually looks like and to try to cut through your, the illusions and try to cut through your biases and, and uh, make sure that you're not, for instance, confusing correlation for causation. So that's something that to look out for. You know, if, if it looks like A caused B, did A really cause B or is there something else that may have cause both. You try to think of other hypotheses. Um, another mistake that we tend to make is to, uh, to selectively look at evidence or to, to use motivated reasoning. So if you cherry pick things in your environment that, that pop out at you and to tend to support things that you already believe or things that you want to believe, um, then maybe you should try to find disconfirming evidence. Great. Thank you so much for being with us today, Matt. And um, we invite our Big Think audience uh, to check out The Seven Laws of Magical Thinking, How Irrational Beliefs Keep Us Happy, Healthy, and Sane. And please check back to BigThink.com to watch additional video clips from our conversation with Matt Hudson and to find out about future live interviews with our experts. Thanks for watching. And Matt Hudson, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me.